Cryptid Hunters, Chapter 33 Home Subject, Eighth Try From Luther at underscore smith at xlink.com to marty at ewolf.com Hey Marty, now that you're back on crypto, safe from enraged television personalities, bald-headed thugs, and hungry crocs, why haven't you responded to my last seven emails? The hurried email you sent from the hijacked helicopter was not nearly enough to satisfy my curiosity. Have you forgotten that I'm still imprisoned here? I know that I'll be pardoned in a few days to join you on your island paradise, but I need news before I get there. You can't imagine how boring it is here without my partner in crime and, and comics. Write me, worriedly yours, Luther. Subject. Respond to 8th try. From Marty at ewolf.com to Luther underscore Smith at xlink.com. Dear Worried, sorry for the delay. I have several excuses. Number one, Wolf gave my gizmo to Laurel. We stopped at the Mokla Bembe nest before we left Lake Tele. Wolf filled some bags with soil from the site, thinking it would be best to incubate the eggs in the same stuff they've been setting in. He also wanted to make sure there wasn't a trace of Mokla Bembe DNA. There wasn't. I wish you could have seen that fire. Laurel and Mausolito stayed behind to monitor the nest. Boring. They'll send hourly data to Ted Bronson to feed into the controls of the incubator. So I'm gizmo-less. Now, you might be thinking I could have just borrowed a gizmo. Nope. When we got back, Ted confiscated all the gizmos on the island. He's making some modifications to them. I'm in the wolf den using one of Wolf's desktop computers. He's only letting me use it for 20 minutes, though. He needs to keep all the data lines open. Number two. When we get back to Kryptos, I stumbled up... When we got back to Kryptos, I stumbled up to my room and slept for three days. They were worried about me, thought I'd been bitten by a setsy fly and had sleeping sickness. They flew in a tropical disease specialist to check me out. After being poked and prodded by the scariest doctors I've ever seen, believe me... I was no longer in the mood for sleep. Dr. Grace thought this guy was great. After he decided that I was going to live, she spent several hours bending his ear, which had an amazing amount of hair growing out of it. Number three. And last but not least, I've been making preparations for your imminent arrival. Depending on when the eggs hatch and what comes out of them, we should have a couple weeks on the island before we set sail for New Zealand. I have several things planned for us before we ship out. Now, for the good stuff. I don't want you to feel left out. So below is an update since we swiped the chopper at Lake Tele. I already told you that Grace and I aren't twins. Wolf is her dad and got his leg bitten off by Mokla Bembe. Blah, blah, blah. What you don't know is that Grace is still 12 years old and we always thought she was so mature. Ha! As it happens, her birthday falls on the same day you arrive here. You might want to think about a way we can really surprise her. Make her 13th special, if you know what I mean. But I warn you, she's not going to be so easy to scare. The Congo toughened her up. She hasn't fainted since Butch nabbed her from the sky house. And believe me, there were things that made me a little faint after that. In other words, a snake in the bed won't do the trick anymore. You'd better get creative. But enough about Grace. When we get to the airport, Phyllis and Phil flew us directly to Kryptos. Ted Bronson invented a dinosaur egg incubator, and I fully expected him to be waiting for us when we arrived. The incubator was there, surrounded by three geeks to explain how it worked, but no Ted. They said that he was already working on another project in the QAQ. Which brings me to one of our missions. When you get here, we need to get at least a glimpse of this guy. Anyway, we set the eggs in the wolf den, which is this incredible room on the top floor of the house. It's filled with TV monitors, computers, fax machines, printers, and a bunch of other electronic stuff I've never seen before. Phil calls it the heart of wolf's cryptid operation. They have these animal scouts all over the world, flying, running, swimming with their video cameras, streaming pictures into the den and the QAQ. People monitor all this stuff 24-7. If they see something unusual, the data is fed into this big computer, 
where it's cataloged and used for what I don't know exactly. This is how they are keeping tabs on the search for my parents. No word on them, but we haven't given up hope. If anyone can find them, Wolf will. Everyone is still concerned about what Blackwood is going to do about Grace and the eggs. Wolf has implemented some extra security measures, but it's all very hush-hush. I don't even know what they are. He's convinced that Blackwood has a spy on the island, so he's being tight-lipped about what he's doing. Which brings me to anchor one of our missions. I think you and I should be able to put our heads together and figure out who the spy is. I've been looking into it, and I have some likely suspects. Anyway, this is what you'll encounter when you finally get here. See you soon, Marty. P.S. Grace paid me the dollar she owed me from the egg bet. I have it pinned to the wall above my bed. I divide my time between the library and the den where Wolf stares at the eggs hour after hour. If they hatch, the babies will be raised on cryptos, then moved to a deserted island he owns that has a similar environment to the Congos. No press release or television news. He'll keep it all very quiet. If the word gets out, he said, Lake Telly will be overrun with scientists, collectors, adventurers, all trying to make a name for themselves and in the process destroying the flora and fauna that have lived there in peace for tens of thousands of years. He's discussing the preservation of the Lake Tele region with government officials. It could take years, decades, or it may never happen, but if it does, with enough safeguards in place, we'll take Moklabembe back home one day. I've filled nearly two moleskins since I've returned to Kryptos. The blank moleskins I've received since I was a child were not sent by my Uncle Timothy as I thought. They were sent by Wolf. My mother used moleskins for her journals and field notes. After she died, her yearly order continued to arrive on the island. Wolf did not have the heart to cancel the order. He said it would be like canceling one of his memories of her. So he had the order transferred to me. Marty told me that my mother's moleskins are in the trunk which I have not opened. Yet. I thought I had left my fears behind in the humid air above the Congo, but I guess some still remain. The eggs have helped me get to know my father and my mother. Without the eggs, Wolf would be down at the coelacanth getting ready for New Zealand. But the eggs have confined him to a single room like a brooding hen. We've been able to talk. He's not the fierce pirate I thought he was on the first day we met. He's kind, shy, funny, and knows a great deal about many things, except for children. He has no idea how to go about raising us. He's told me a lot about my mother, but it's painful for him. I can see it in his eyes and hear it in his voice, which goes very quiet when he talks about her. Your mother was not only beautiful, he said today. She was the smartest person I'd ever met. When she left the ark, she bloomed. She woke up happy and went to bed happy. She devoured each day like a hungry wolf. I asked him what I was like when I was a baby. A lot of trouble, he said. Fearless. We couldn't leave you alone for a second. You crawled onto the spring when you were four months old, nearly drowned. The next day I glanced away for a second and you were back in the water. We had to put a fence around the water to keep you out of it. You started to walk when you were ten months old. Run, actually. We kept a rope tied around your waist. But of course you figured out how to untie every knot I tried. I'm still practicing on the high wire. I've raised it a foot more and... Marty walked into the library where Grace was writing. How's the parrot? He walked over to Congo's perch and offered him a peanut, which Congo refused. He's been a little off all day, Grace said, putting her pen down. I told Wolf he said he'd come down later and take a look at him. Marty raised his eyebrows. And leave the eggs? He wandered over to the squid and coelacanth tanks, imitated the occupants for a few moments, then looked at his watch. I'd better get into the kitchen and give Bertha a hand with dinner. That reminds me, Grace said. I was talking to Wolf last night, and he said there was no canned chicken in the canister they dropped. Really? Marty said innocently. Bertha must have put a few cans in without him knowing. He turned to leave. Marty? He turned back to her. 
What did you feed me that morning? Marty grinned as he backed toward the door. Green eggs and mamba, he said, then ran.